All right, maybe while we're running through um, those photos about Crystal, now let me just quickly introduce maybe tonight's uh, late afternoon's program. We obviously are here to kind of commemorate the anniversary of Kristallnacht. And uh, we're gonna do this today in a slightly different manner, meaning not by one lecture, but rather by five or six shorter presentations that gonna look at Kristallnacht, you know, from different vantage points. And the presentations are coming from both faculty and graduate students, and they're gonna be rotating around each one of them, probably taking no more than a couple of minutes. But just so we remind ourselves the Kristallna Crystal Night, or as you know, many probably rightly argue these days, rather an event that should be remembered as a night of, of a pogrom night and in lots of ways, um, feeling that obviously that night, not just crystal broke, but lots of other violence was enacted that became in many ways, probably one of the most pivotal moments in the history of German Jewry. If, German Jews in 33 might have still been left unclear or unsure about where things were going. It was very clear in the aftermath of Kristallna that for them, the very possibility of continuing life in Germany seemed to have come to an end. And we can see this very clearly by the accelerated migration after Kristallna, that at this point, Jews out of Germany and Austria were willing to go no matter where they could. Because in lots of ways that night from the 9th to the 10th was a night of, of unprecedented violence sponsored by the state, but with large scale participation of civilians as well. We just marked you know, the bigger events and rioters destroyed over 260 synagogues, um, often synagogues that were in the middle of cities um, in the presence of many who who saw that the destruction of the synagogues were spectacles. Over 7,000 Jewish businesses were damaged or destroyed. And over 30,000 Jewish men and women were arrested and incarcerated. So there's in other words, you know, very quickly between these numbers, you could see much more that had happened. It's also the night where unfortunately also a good number of individuals were killed. Um, at least today's historians um, count the number of going well into the hundreds. Looking back at Kristallnacht, you know, historians very clearly see this in intensification of violence as a critical stepping stone toward the final solution. That what had maybe begun in a slightly different way in 33, and now in 38, had acquired a certain virulence and violence and large-scale participation that without Kristallnacht, it would be hard to conceive of how Germans ever would have been able to embark on, on, on the Holocaust as, as it later was going to happen. It is also clear, and that I think is interesting, is that for the wider German population, Kristallnacht was really the last kind of event that marked into their memories, the last kind of thing that they collectively remembered as something that happened on a large scale across Germany. So much so that when the German cities were attacked in 43 by British and American air forces, the Germans you know, looked at their own destroyed cities and at the destroyed churches and were looking back at 38 as a way of explaining why this would happen to them. So in lots of ways, in their own minds, this was the kind of critical moment as well, where they had started to commit a crime that they could not any longer explain, you know, in a rational manner, and therefore saw the destruction of their own cities as their deserved punishment at times. For us, looking back again, you know, we see again 38 as being critical in the kind of evolution of the path toward genocide. But any of these perspectives would not have been available for the contemporaries in 38 who experienced this. And so that brings us, I think, a little closer to what we're trying to do today. So instead of talking about the history of Kristallna, we are trying to look at the Kristallna through the lens of particular individuals, of an individual and his diary, 
of a newspaper article, of statistics, and of other you know individual kind of ways by which individuals observed and thought about the the significance of Kristallnacht before it became a large event that you know was written up later in newspapers and eventually in in, in history books because. For anyone watching what happened at their doorsteps on either the late night of, of November 9th or on the 10th, obviously, at that point, they only saw what they saw and wouldn't have immediately known the full scale of what happened um, across the Third Reich. And so therefore, it's like little pieces of evidence of sorts that kind of bring together the the ways by which this event was initially you know, encountered and experienced and what it would have meant. And so I'm happy to introduce now in particular, the clever graduate students and faculty that the Ackerman Center prides itself of having. And I think our very first um, individual who's gonna present is Philip, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Philip? That's right, thank you, Dr. Romer. Um, my name is Philip Barber, and I am, as Dr. Romer mentioned, a research assistant and graduate student at the Ackerman Center. And for my contribution to this evening's event of remembrance, I felt compelled to call attention to those victims whose final act of defiance was to deny the Nazis the power to take their lives. The pogrom of November 9, 1938, was to become known as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. But as Dr. Romer mentioned, it's important to remember that it was not only the synagogues and the businesses and the homes that were destroyed, it was human beings who were destroyed. It was the Nazis who first described the events of November 9 as the night of broken glass, dismissing the magnitude of their crime and ensuring that it would not be by the killing, the suicides, or the arrests that the events would be remembered. But what characterized this widespread and organized pogrom more than the destruction of the buildings was, as I mentioned, the destruction of the Jewish people. Consumed by terror and faced with the horrors of the impending torture, many victims of Kristallnacht chose to commit Selbstmord or self-murder, the German term for suicide. And while the events of Kristallnacht are remembered as taking place in a matter of only a couple of days, the 9th and 10th of November, the devastation the pogrom incited was long lasting for the victims. According to Lucy Davidovics, for months immediately following Kristallnacht, suicides accounted for more than half of Jewish burials in Germany. Adding insult to injury, the stigma that often accompanies suicide threatens to rob these victims of the Nazi terror of their rightful role, rightful status as martyrs. But these Jews chose resistance through suicide. And their final act was to deny the Nazis the power to torture them, the power to murder them. Had they not, some of them may have survived, but many of them would not. Providing grisly details from witness accounts, Martin Gilbert in his History of the Holocaust described the fate of 62 such Jewish men, including two rabbis who had been seized during Kristallnacht and sent to concentration camps. They were actually taken to Sachsenhausen north of Berlin under police escort where they were handed over to SS. Now upon their arrival, they were forced to run a gauntlet of spades, clubs and whips. As they were beaten, they fell. And as they fell, they were beaten further. This orgy of beating according to witnesses lasted for roughly half an hour. And when it was over, 12 of the 62 were dead, their skulls smashed. The others were all unconscious. The eyes of some had even been knocked out, their faces flat and shapeless. Under the threat of such a fate, to have taken one's own life was to extend to oneself one great and final mercy and to snatch from the hands of the Nazis the power to exert upon them such inhumane and unconscionable cruelties. Horst Stuckman, a German pastor, argued rightly at the time that the victims of the suicide during and following Kristallnacht must be regarded as victims of the pogrom, just as those who were truncheoned to death at Sachsenhausen. Josephine Barr was one such victim. Before taking her life on November 11, 1938, she wrote to her children in Palestine, and I quote, 
my darling children, with a heavy heart, I have to part from you. Don't cry. God has decided that this should be our fate. It hurts me terribly to cause you pain. We are all suffering. God will forgive me. Finally, she asked her children to give her husband all of the love that they had for her. Should he return from imprisonment? Her husband, Leopold, had served his country proudly and honorably in the First World War, earning an iron cross. Nonetheless, he was Jewish. And he was among those arrested during the night of broken glass. But this decorated German war hero was not to survive the Holocaust. His service to his country was of no consequence to the Nazis, who murdered him three years later in 1941. Moshe Zimmerman observed that suicide was a common response to the insult and humiliation experienced by many Jews in that November pogrom. And he explains that the emotional blow was in many cases harsher than the physical abuse. In many cases, the background to the decision to commit suicide, he said, was the question that vexed many Jews. How is it that we, who have been such a part of this nation, are so proud of it and who have contributed so much to it, have become pariahs? Today, as we remember the victims of Kristallnacht, let us not neglect to honor the memory of those victims who bore the terrible weight of Selbstmord. have to unmute myself, sorry. Um, I think, thank you very much, Philip, for your presentation. I should have said earlier, if you have any questions, we decided because we have so many presenters that it would be the easiest for you to post them in the chat window instead of unmuting yourself, okay? So if you have questions, by all means, um, just post them there. It's not my great pleasure to introduce or hand over to Professor Dr. Sarah Valente, one of our talented visiting assistant professors. Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Romer. Thank you, Philip, for that wonderful, uh, for sharing that with us. I would like to share here a PowerPoint while I speak. If you can get this. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So thank you all for being here today with us as we remember Kristallnacht. Um, today I would like to share with you the words of a young man, uh, Klaus Langer, who was 14 years old when Kristallnacht happened. He had been born in April of 1924 in Upper Silesia, which at the time was part of Germany. And Klaus, his parents, Eric and Rose, and his grandmother, Mina, settled in Essen, Germany in 1936, when he was 12 years old. Um, he was a member of the Zionist youth group, and at times his membership was a source of conflict with his parents who felt socially, culturally, and nationally German. Um, and so I would like to read for you today um, his diary entry that was written on November 11th, 1938, where he detailed the events that had happened the previous day. Um, and I should also mention that his writings are found in the 2002 publication by Alexander Zapruder, which is titled Salvage Pages, Young Writers' Diaries of the Holocaust. And when he writes this, he is 14 years old. So let me read um, his entry for you. November 11th, 1938. The past three days brought significant changes in our lives. On November 7, a German legation member was assassinated in Paris. He died two days later. The following day, on November 10, came the consequences. At 3 o'clock, the synagogue and the Jewish Youth Center were put on fire. Then they began to destroy Jewish businesses. During the morning, private homes also were being demolished. Fires were started at single homes belonging to Jews. At 6.30 in the morning, the Gestapo came to our home and arrested father and mother. Mother returned after about one and a half hours. Dad remained and was put in prison. In the morning, I went to the Fernsey home. Bobby was at the synagogue and at the youth center in the morning and saw how they burned. Later, we went to the daycare center where the children had been brought from the community home, which they had to flee during the night. We returned to our neighborhood by two o'clock. Not far from us, we saw a gang vandalizing a home, throwing things out of the window. 
When I went around the corner and looked up my street, there was nothing to see. It looked peaceful. I therefore returned directly to our home. When I turned into the front yard, I saw that the house was damaged. I walked on glass splinters. In the hallway, I met Frau Baum, who lived upstairs. I ran into our apartment and found unbelievable destruction in every room. It was the same in the apartment of the caretaker below us. Mother and grandmother were there. My parents' instruments were destroyed. The dishes were broken. The windows were broken. Furniture upturned. The desk was turned over. Drawers and mirrors were broken and radios smashed. The kitchen and the bathroom were untouched. The upstairs room also was left alone, including my father's cello. The cellar also was not disturbed. The apartment of the caretaker was in much worse condition. In the evening, mother brought gold and other valuables for safe keep safekeeping to Christian acquaintances. We wanted to spend the night at home, but the caretaker urged us to go to her relatives where we could spend the night. I read until late. In the middle of the night at 2.30 a.m., the stormtroopers storm smashed windows and threw stones against store shutters. After a few minutes, they demanded to be let into the house. Allegedly, they were looking for weapons. After they found no weapons, they left. After that, no one was able to go back to sleep. Everyone sat in one room. I tried, but I couldn't go back to sleep. After a while, I went back to where they were sitting and found, and found they had dozed off. The time passed terribly slowly. Then we thought there was still another person in the house who was, who was making noise. Finally, at 5 a.m., I saw a policeman outside who walked back and forth. I shall never forget that night. The next day, rumor had it that children under 16 of age would also be arrested. I wanted to flee and ride my bicycle to Christian friends of my parents who lived in the Rhineland. Mother objected, however, and I remained at home, of course. The next night, we all wanted to sleep at home, but we were too upset. At 9.30 at night, we went to the Cosmans, where the gangsters had already been at us. They had destroyed everything. We had calmed down somewhat and slept there quite well. Books could be written about all that had happened and about which we now begin to learn more. But I have to be careful. A new regulation was issued that the Jews in Germany have to pay 1 billion Reichsmarks for restitution. What for? For the damage the Nazis had done to the Jews in Germany. I shall return to that subject later. My room will stay as it is. I am not going to go to school as long as dad is not at home. I now want to go to Eretz Israel as quickly as possible, maybe with the first youth Aliyah. The plan for making Aliyah was made some time ago. The Bund, of course, has come to a standstill. Its leaders were arrested. And here in the next slide, I have an image from his city synagogue, the Essen synagogue, as him and his friend um, saw it the, the morning um, of November 10th of 1938. And a few days, he continues um, to write about his father being released from prison. And so I just want to read a few, one more entry for you. This is from November 28, 1938. On Wednesday, 14 days after he was arrested, father was released from jail. There was great joy. Afterwards, father talked about his imprisonment. The food and treatment were quite tolerable. On the first day of his arrest, father was left all alone, which made him very nervous. Later, he was placed in a small cell with two others. They were allowed to walk outside their cell, which brought them in contact with prisoners in other cells. Most disturbing was their lack of communication with their families. The same applied to us. Before the second visit to the prison, grandmother was up at 3 a.m. wanting to know whether it was time to leave for the prison. The women were harried to no end. They had to run from one place to another to get permission to leave packages for their husbands and relatives, which left them no more than 10 minutes for visiting. Mother always returned from these visits most discouraged. The last two days before the prisoners were released were the worst. On November 23rd, father came home and immediately began to work on the immigration process. The only two countries to which father's pension could be transferred were Chile and Palestine. 
By his calculation, his income would not be enough to make a living in Palestine, and the question then arose whether he would be able to supplement his pension. There was also the question whether the Nazis would continue to send his pension abroad. As an amateur musician, it was almost impossible to make a living in Palestine because of the many other Jewish musicians who had already immigrated there. In Chile, the situation was somewhat better and it would have been possible to live there on a pension. Yesterday, I applied with several others for making Aliyah. I don't know which of these opportunities will work out, but I plan to take the first one that comes along. There also is a chance to attend a trade school in England if that opportunity in Holland, uh, in Holland fails to come true, I may have to go to England, whether I like it or not. Father had to give up hope for emigrating to Argentina. He is now hoping to get a business license for Palestine. It would be best if we could all go to Palestine. And here I have an image uh, from his diaries, the original um, copies. And I should say that, you know, after Kristallnacht, as we see in this last entry, the Langer family desperately attempted to emigrate from Germany, but with every attempt, they were met with internal and external obstacles that made it impossible for them to leave. Klaus himself was able to escape from Germany about a year later on September of 1939, eventually settling in Palestine. And heartbreakingly though, his parents and his grandmother perished in the Holocaust. And so may their memories always be a blessing. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah. I mean, what was really noteworthy about this um, diary entry is how up close it is at first, right? Describing the you know, very specific details without drawing any bigger conclusions. And then however, eventually with a little bit of distance coming already to, you know, up with this you know, view that this is it. We got to get out of here. We, in this case, we want to get to Palestine. But I think the diary really captures this almost overwhelming sense of what is happening. And it's just trying almost like a camera of sorts to kind of just document it toward coming to the point of making conclusions about it. Very different perspective that one um, is getting now from a newspaper abroad. And I think if I'm not messing up the order, that brings us to Angie. Uh, where we uh, look again at the Kristallnacht, but now from a little bit more distance from across the Atlantic. Is that right, Angie? Yes, it is. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rummer. Uh, good evening. My name is Angie Simmons. I am a PhD student in the History of Ideas program and a research assistant for the Ackerman Center. The following excerpts are taken from an article in the Times from November 11th, 1938, titled Nazi Attack on Jews, Destruction and Plunder. From our correspondent, Berlin, November 10th. The murder in Paris of Herr von Rath led in Germany today to scenes of systemic plunder and destruction, which have seldom had their equal in a civilized country since the Middle Ages. In every part of the Reich, synagogues were set on fire or dynamited, Jewish shops smashed and ransacked, and individual Jews arrested or hounded by bands of young Nazis through the streets. The orgy began here in the early hours of this morning with almost simultaneous outbreaks of fire in nine of the 12 synagogues of Berlin, preceded by attacks upon the Jews. The synagogue in the, uh, in the Faustenstrasse, for example, was entered by a mob of young hooligans who destroyed the interior furnishings of the building and carried off the altar cloth. This was solemnly burned in the neighboring Wittenberg Platz in the presence of a large crowd, whereupon the enthusiasts returned to the synagogue with cans of petrol and set fire to the building. When I visited it this morning, the synagogue was still smoldering. The fire brigade had confined its efforts chiefly to preventing the spread of fire to the neighboring houses and the synagogue itself appeared to be gutted. While these attacks were being made upon Jewish sacred edifices, other gangs of young men, all in plain clothes, but evidently acting according to a systemic plan, toward the streets of Berlin, smashing the windows of every Jewish shop which they encountered. Hardly one of these businesses, easily distinguishable by the fact that the name of the proprietor must by law appear in a large white letters on their windows, escaped the attentions of these roughs. A short time later, another gang arrived and carried the work of destruction a step further. And this process continued until nothing was left of the shop or its contents. 
As this dispatch is written in the evening, the destructive work is still in progress. A tour of the devastated areas lasting the greater part of the day produced some strange impressions. The morning in Kurfürstendam, the chief shopping street in Berlin, Jew hunts were in progress. On two occasions, I saw terrified Jews running before a small crowd of pursuers, led in every case by young men of the type who have been chiefly responsible for today's destruction. In one instance, a woman was in the hands of a crowd which had backed her against a wall. The windows of the well-known banking house, H. Offhauser, were stoned last night, and this morning a Nazi commissioner took control of the business, which was in course of being Aryanized. Herr Martin Offhauser, the senior partner, was arrested. Another partner, Herr Emil Kramer, and his wife committed suicide at their home today. All Jewish families were told by the political police that they would have to leave Munich within 48 hours from this morning and were instructed to let the police know by 6 p.m. today at what time they would hand over the keys of their dwellings and garages. In some cases, they were told that they must leave Germany and were made to sign an undertaking to this effect. According to the reports from Nuremberg, the Jews had been treated there with great ruthlessness. The house of one Jew was raided by stormtroopers who beat him and his wife pulled their children out of bed and left only after having destroyed furniture, mirrors, and carpets. The tales of destruction and the methods employed in other parts of the Reich differed in no way from those employed in Berlin. It is impossible to say how many synagogues have been burned in, Germany's, in Germany during the past 24 hours, but the newspapers report arson in the synagogues at Stettin, Frankfurt on Main, Constance, Cologne, Lübeck, and Leipzig. From the last name city too comes the news that Herr Bomberg and Herr Herz, the Jewish owners of a large department store have been arrested on their surprising charge of setting fire to their own shops in order to collect the insurance money. This evening, Dr. Goebbels insisted a proclamation to the German people in the following terms. The justified and understandable indignation of the German people at the cowardly Jewish assassination of a German diplomatist in Paris has been vented in a wide degree during the past night. In many towns and localities in the Reich, reprisals were made on Jewish buildings and shops. The entire population is henceforward strictly enjoined immediately to desist from all further demonstrations against the Jews, no matter what their nature. The final answer to the murderous Jewish assault in Paris will be given to the Jews by legislative means or by decree. It may thus be hoped that the unprecedented Jewish riots, which Dr. Goebbels depicted as the result of the spontaneous outburst of indignation, but which in fact were clearly an action carefully planned and carried through with the utmost precision, have come to an end. There remains, however, the question of repairing the damage done, which in Berlin alone must amount to tens of millions of marks, and which it is impossible to compute for the Reich as a whole. The insurance companies, including several British firms, have placed the decision in the hands of Dr. Funk, the Minister for Economics, who tomorrow will decide whether they are liable for today's damage. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. So this um, article that Angie um, shared with us is just one of the many examples that illustrated a very simple point that Kristalna really happened in plain sight, not just to, very, to the Germans who actively participated, uh, but also to the world. And therefore there's an endless archive of new newspaper articles about Kristallna that can be found uh, nowadays. Um, you know, whether it's the Dallas Morning News or the New York Times or whatever newspaper people read in Iowa, um, there's an article about Kristallna more likely uh, there to be found, which says something about the sheer visibility and the shocking nature of this event that was immediately registered around the world. It's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Professor David Patterson. David, um, you're gonna travel back with us across the Atlantic and back again into yeah. the sources of one individual, Fackenheim, I think it is, right? Yes, um, and, and thank you all for, for your testimony and not just, you know, relating a history, uh, what, 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 of, what are, brilliant students that have shared with us uh, continues to transform us into witnesses. And uh, as witnesses, we are entrusted with memory. 
And as the generation of those who live through this period passes, um, immediately after them, uh, what is passed on is to those of us who had the great blessing to actually know them. Um, Emil Fackenheim was uh, among the great Jewish philosophers to undertake a prolonged 30, 35 year philosophical response to the Holocaust. I had the great blessing of knowing him during the last 10 years of his life. Uh, he passed away on the 18th of September, 2003 at the age of 87. And he told me his story of Kristallna. He and his older brother, Ernst, were uh, studying in Berlin. They were studying under uh, Leo Beck, another great uh, Jewish thinker and philosopher at the Hochschule, the, uh, what was what the, the, the center of Jewish learning in Berlin. Uh, when Kristallnacht happens, of course, uh, all around them, they, they're seeing the destruction of Jewish shops and Jewish synagogues. The synagogues were the target, not the shops. 267 synagogues were destroyed in Germany, Austria, and Sudetenland. Almost every single synagogue was either vandalized or destroyed. And so he and his brother are seeing this around them, and they're wondering, uh, what's happening elsewhere? This is the, the night of November 9th. What's happening? Um, they were from the town of Halle, uh, where he was born and where their mother and father lived. In fact, they lived, if you can believe this, they lived in the same building as the Heydrich family in Halle. Uh, Reinhard Heydrich, a name that some of you may know, an infamous SS man, uh, which I won't go into. So he and his brother Ernst said, look, uh, the, well, let's call our mother, see what's going on there. They called their mother and uh, their mother was in tears saying, they've taken your father, they've taken your father. And so uh, Emil, and Aaron said, one of, us need, we, one of us has to go there, but one of us has to stay here. Which, which one of us should go? So it was decided that Emil would go to Halle. Aaron stayed in Berlin. Uh, Emil arrived in Halle the, the next morning, the morning of the 10th, uh, to be with his mother. And he, and he figured, well, the, the best place for me to hide would be where the Gestapo have already been, namely our apartment where they took our father. And his, his father was, one of, was a renowned jurist, a legal scholar in Germany. and was known way, you know, internationally. Um, however, it happened that, as Emil told me, that their phone was tapped. I don't, I'm not sure what the phone tapping technology was at the time, but apparently the Gestapo knew somehow that he had gone there. And on November 11th, they came to get him. They took him to Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Uh, I've spoken as Emil, you know, as a survivor has a tale to tell those of us who knew the survivors, but Emil, never called himself a survivor. He refused to use that term for himself because he was only, only in Sachsenhausen. Um, he and his father spent three months in the camp. Um, the British consulate intervened. At this time, you, you recall, they're not yet at war. So Brit the Britain still has a consul in Berlin on behalf of his, of his father who was a famous scholar. So after three months in Sachsenhausen near the end of February, 1939, uh, Emil got out, his father got out and, and the Gestapo told him, you better get out of Germany in the next three weeks while you have the chance. Um, and that was an invitation that one does not refuse. However, 
um, a mill who was studying with Leo Beck for, for his smicha, his uh, ordination as rabbi, went back to the, the rabbinic school. He tried to warn all of his fellow students, you got to get out, you got to get out, but he wanted to finish smicha before he left the, the ordination. And of course he said, all, he told me, we, we, we all thought we, we, will, we will study now, we'll leave later. But uh, that door was closing fast. So um, he got his ordination. He and his father got out uh, in like May, 1939. And uh, he, he went on to become a, the great philosopher. His brother, meanwhile, Ernst, who was not picked up by the Gestapo, went into hiding. And his brother Ernst, after being in hiding until, in, until 1943, finally committed suicide in Berlin. So, which was a murder. It wasn't just a suicide. It, it was the outcome of the National Socialist program of murdering, systematically murdering the Jews. So the one who went into the camp got out, the one who stayed out of the camp ended up, you know, another casualty of Kristalna. I mean, he would forced him into hiding. In hiding, he, he, he became desperate, he finally killed himself. So uh, Sarah mentioned the word home in the memoir she read, Home, 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 Kristallnacht was the beginning of rendering every Jew in Nazi Europe homeless, forcing everyone into hiding, into a camp, into a ghetto. Homelessness was central to the assault on, on the Jews, Judaism, and the soul. And so um, that, that's what I have to say, to, to pass on the story of my friend, my teacher, Emil Fackenheim, and his, uh, his experience of Kristallna. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I think, you know, the kind of loss of home and of safety is a clear marker of, of the experience of Kristallna because quite literally, um, the violence didn't just occur on the streets, but also um, came along with intrusion into private homes and therefore in memories about Kristallnacht, often this kind of intrusion into the private sphere also from the perspective of children is something that inscribed itself um, forever and ever in their respective memories. So I think that's, you know, the quite little loss of home that is usually associated with a mm -hmm. kind of safety and security was, was quite literally often um, also lost um, in, in the course of Kristalna. Now yes. my great pleasure. May I add, may I add I one more thing? So. Can I yes, add? Of course. And uh, I just want to add that in, in uh, the synagogue here in Plano, Nishmat Am, we have a, a, a Nair Tamid, an eternal light hanging over the ark in our synagogue that was retrieved from a synagogue in Vorach, Germany that was destroyed during Kristallnacht. So there is a remnant, physical remnant of Kristallnacht in one of the synagogues here in Dallas. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Amel, um, who's going to yet again provide us with another perspective built around testimonies given many, many years later, I believe. Amel? You have to mute yourself, otherwise it'll be probably ed edifying, but uh, a bit more puzzling what you have to say. Okay. Is it better now? Oh, much better. Okay, Thank good. You. Yes, I am very much interested in the question of testimony and the wider context of representation. And um, it's um, today I'm gonna take it on a little bit a wider context from just Crystal Knot, but I will come back to it at the end. Um, and I would like to start by saying that in contrast to the natural assumption that history and memory has a lot in common, in fact, historians are often skeptical of the value of memories because uh, they are skeptical that we can offer 
from memory accurate historical knowledge. On the other hand, uh, testimonies are significant because they offer what is beyond documentary knowledge, what, uh, which is an understanding of the experiences of the Holocaust and its aftermath. The process of collecting Holocaust testimonies in public archives, such as the USC uh, Shoah Foundation uh, Visual History Archive, did not start until 1994. And according to uh, Dory Lau, um, who's a, a psychoanalyst and Holocaust survivor himself, this delay is not coincidental. The belated temporality of collecting Holocaust testimonies is a testament to the belated temporality of the traumatic memory itself. And belated temporality is only one of the characteristics of traumatic memory. Um, we often uh, see things that include uh, confusion, amnesia, exaggeration, fantasy, and indeed mistakes. In response to an account of a female Holocaust survivor who narrated in her testimony that she had witnessed the blowing up of four chimneys in Auschwitz, while in reality it was only one, test, uh, one chimney that was blown up, um, Laub commented, the woman was testifying not to the number of chimneys blown up, but to something else, more radical, more crucial, the reality of an unimaginable occurrence. It is necessary to understand that the testimony itself is a historical event of its own right. And uh, on another front, away from the testimony itself or the process of witnessing something, it's also the process of viewing. So us as viewers of Holocaust testimonies, that also needs a little bit of a closer examination because it has a profound effect on us. And according to um, La Capra, Students watching Holocaust testimonies often feel overwhelmed by the accounts of unimaginable horror and worry sometimes if they are not responding with sufficient sympathy. Moreover, what La Capra calls the hyperbolic aesthetic of the sublime evokes in the viewer a typical response of silent awe. This kind of excess sympathy leads to full identification with the narrator and in contrast to common assumption, it actually hinders our possibility of understanding what we're listening to. This problem of representation is actually very uh, famous in feminist uh, film studies. And the uh, theorization of the effects of spectators identification, they come up with some uh, strategies to distract from an uncritical excess of sympathy. One of these strategies is reflexivity, or in other words, making the audience aware of the filmmaking process itself. Now, in the case of the testimony, the reflexivity is attainable by calling attention to the process of witnessing. Like a film, a testimony is constructed. It is a constructed reality, and it's crucial to pay attention to that in class, for example. There are two examples of Holocaust testimonies archives that I would like to present to you as an examples of one way that is reflexive and another one that is kind of passive. And I need to share my screen to, uh, to do that exercise. So let's see. Desktop. Share computer sound. You probably see my presentation now and my not very interesting desktop. Let's go here. Okay. So the first one here is at the Yale University Library, which is the Fortunoff video archive. This is the layout of it. It's very simple. And um, once you click on the external link, it will take you to a YouTube channel where you can listen to the testimony. And uh, without any introduction, it's gonna like suddenly get you in, in um, confrontation with, with the survivor. Uh, January 8th, 34. And uh, I had a very happy childhood until the Nazi came in. The star. The star. Everyone was wearing a star. What did your non-Jewish friend... And everybody was looking at us. Of course. 
And when I wanted to have a good time and play with the other kids, I would take off the star. And my mother would yell and scream, and she said, you cannot do this, you cannot do this. You are a Jewish little girl, and you must wear the star. That's what they want. So in this case of a testimony, when you look around the um, supplementary information, it's very little that tells you the context of what's going on. And um, if you try to download the PDF that comes with it, that also doesn't tell you much. Another extreme different example is the US Shoah Foundation. And in this case, I'm going to write Kristallnacht. Okay. And it's kind of come up with a very um, large number of testimonies, but it also gives me um, ways of kind of destructing or seeing the bigger picture. Which collection do I want? And does language matter? The language of the survivor, the gender of the survivor. And um, moreover, if you click on the testimony itself, Let's see, I'm going to limit it to English for now and to available videos and to a female survivors. Once you get inside the uh, testimony itself, you're also confronted with all what went into building this narrative. There is a geographical aspect to it. I, he was and at the very beginning, it's going to give you a list of who was involved, who's the photographer, who's the interviewer. And the interviewer is going to have a much more active role in kind of helping the survivor narrating their story. And in this case, the interviewer kind of played the role of the oral historian. This kind of um, layout kind of distracts this idea that we can just um, identify with the survivor. Moreover, we need, we need to see or we're able to see that memory has people, has geography, has temporality, and has artifacts that goes into it. And you can download all of these texts, like the, um, uh, what, is, what is it, the, um, the transcript. And these transcripts are massive and you can download for 3000 different testimonies. And in this case, you can build a collective narrative and you can use tools of digital humanities to see things that we're not, we're unable to see by listening to individual stories. So um, I'm very excited about how this project turned to be very uh, organized and kind of giving more and more tools. When it first started, it was a little bit limited and one uh, other aspect that I would like to add to this, that when you um, look at the US Shoah Foundation, it also gives other genocide survivors accounts. And um, other than kind of looking at a comparison between one genocide versus the other, what actually connects hum humanities together is um, the idea of the, the trauma memory and how it's more universal than any other thing. And that actually, um, when you listen to testimonies from very different experiences, the process of the recalling and being a witness is almost the same. And that's the part that kind of like gets all of us to see how we're all in, in this together. And then at this note, I'm going to stop here because I can keep going forever. Thank you. Thank you, Amel. And uh, if you don't mind uh, sharing your uh, screen, um, I think that, you know, that's a really powerful way to end. And I think it just, you know, brings up, a, you know, hopefully a very obvious point is, and that is when we compare different atrocities and different, you know, forms of violence, we often get stuck in comparing and contrasting. But when we do that, we are really doing that largely from the perspective of the crime and the perpetrators and like ML, emphasized when we look at it from the perspective of remembrance, then the accounting of that which the victims experience actually shares far more things than, than it often um, seems to, to divide. I want us now, however, move over into another aspect of, um, of um, Amal's presentation, which we're gonna get at um, one more time in a different way, and that's the question of history and memory. 
And uh, we're doing that in a very particular way. I'm gonna introduce now, uh, well, she will introduce herself, Shafali, who actually allows us to do certain things that otherwise we wouldn't. But the basic point of that is that we are using initially a memorial book, um, which was really solely compiled for the purpose of memorializing the victims. In this particular case, memorial book for the victims of Hamburg, um, a city in the north of Germany, and as you might know, uh, my hometown. And that, however, while it was compiled for the purpose of remembrance, nonetheless can be studied today in order possibly to, to, to understand something about the history that it also encapsulates and represents. Let me otherwise just follow um, custom as we've done before, introduce myself maybe first. My name is Niels Rome. I'm the director of the Ackerman Center. I'm the proud director of the Ackerman Center and the interim dean of the School of the Arts and Humanities. But I want to introduce first, or let her introduce Shafali first. Shafali? Hello, my name is Shafali, and I'm a graduate student uh, doing my master's in management science and a research. She uh, likes to be very quick, uh, which however should not distract from the fact that she does a lot. And she does in particular a lot with what um, goes into what we call big data. So this memorial book that I'm talking about, I'm gonna share it on my screen, um, lists about 6,000 names and their respective fate um, of these individuals, like I said, for one particular town, Hamburg. And now I want us to look at three of, her, of the visualizations that Shafali put together. Um, the first one is imprisonment. I hope you can all see now my screen, right? Yeah. Someone nods, okay, thank you, nods. Um, and I think this is something that had come up earlier in, in Philip's presentation that um, he rightly reminded us that again, the Kristallnacht was not just the night where uh, crystals broke, but in lots of ways also the night or the, uh, you know, what occasioned the incarceration of large numbers of German Jews over 30,000. So in this case, we're looking though at a very specific example only of the sample of, uh, of um, imprisonment from the city of Hamburg um, of, of a database that comprises only about 6,000 names. So we have to keep that in mind a little bit. And I think, you know, very noticeable is obviously how the numbers jump here, right? The number of imprisonment jumps up high very quickly in the aftermath of, you know, from November onwards and then further up. What I think it also tells us is something about the um, age group of those that are incarcerated. And the majority of those lie, you know, in between this kind of age of 31 onwards. In other words, um, one almost has a feeling that one deliberately incarcerates you, so to speak, the, the providers of the family. In other words, it's not coincidental who one goes after. Um, the part that I found most interesting in, in this particular visualization is that a good many end up in the city prison. In other words, they, in this particular case, um, they end up in a prison, which is one of the suburbs of, of Hamburg Fußbüttel, uh, which up until that point was largely a, a, a prison for criminals and had you know, very clearly that association. So in lots of ways, one utilizes here the existing facilities as much as you know, another larger number, a large number here also is, is uh, directed at Sachsenhausen. But we see a mixture, in other words, of incarceration that is clearly accelerating in, in terms of numbers, um, you know, targeting particular um, age groups, I think we could say. And then in lots of ways results in the incarceration often also still in utilizing nearby pre-existing facilities as much as they are relying also on, on, um, on those. So we see a Buchenwald, Dachau, Dachau and Sachsenhausen. So this is one of the, the visualizations, um, which I think just brings out really this point that one of the really new experiences for German Jews at this point would have been the large scale imprisonment of, of individuals who had up until this point were probably not even anticipating that this could possibly be uh, feasible for them. The other thing that um, had also come out in the various presentations was suicide. 
I think Professor Patterson had brought it up. Um, and then I think Philip had also mentioned it earlier. Again, remember that we're looking here at a very, very small sampling, but we very clearly can see the increase of suicides um, toward the tail end of 1938. What I find more interesting is that if we look more widely at the sample of, of the data from Hamburg in terms of suicides, and we see um, that the, the balance between men and women is, is far more even. But in this immediate moment, you see a great imbalance between male and female suicides, which you know, I think has a little bit to do with the fact that for men, this was you know, who often had still had experience from 33, a steady decline of their respective holds as a, a roles of providers for family, as a securers and you know, of, of their respective families. This was a final blow to their stature and their sense of, of safety, while also, you know, this is now 38, struggling really to quickly to come up and to think of any alternatives. So in terms of places where they could possibly go and, and find um, another kind of opportunities for them to live. One of the kind of artists of choices that all of a sudden did become available in the immediate aftermath of, of Kristana was actually Shanghai. And uh, I, when I visited um, China, I think before the pandemic, when we were all still traveling and were doing many other things, I visited the museum and they um, gave me access to the database of Jews who made, um, who were able to, to escape to, to Shanghai. And so again, Shafali used that bigger data sampling that we had to kind of try to understand something about the individuals that come there. And I think there are a couple of really interesting things that we learned very quickly about it. First of all, if we look at the age bracket, it very quickly con communicates for us something that the ones who make it to Shanghai uh, comprise various age groups, uh, men and women. In other words, if we put the two together, we are looking at family migration. And we're not looking at individuals who make it, but we're looking at entire families that are making it um, together. So that's very, very significant about this um, kind of wave of, of refugees. But then we also realizing something else, which I think is equally important for us. And that is that while we are widely and not incorrectly associating the, the safety of, of German and Austrian Jews who make it to, to Shanghai in the aftermath of Kristallnacht, mostly with Jews from Germany and from Austria. And you know, there are about 17 to 18,000 Jews who make it to Shanghai, uh, born out here by the numbers, right? You see a large number of German Jews, large number of Austrian Jews based on that, this database. Within those categories of German Jews and of Austrian Jews are also Jews from numerous other places who for one reason or another just unfortunately had happened to be in either Austria or Germany and therefore are often included, or who also regardless of their location tried for other reasons um, to make it over to Shanghai. So that in lots of ways, while on the whole, it is not incorrect to think about the refugees of Shanghai as being largely German and Austrian Jews, it comprises actually a slightly more diverse group I and mean, internally also a large number of Polish Jews um, and Russian um, immigrants, but also further down um, a good number of, of individuals from Portugal, 60 here uh, from Turkey and from a good many other places. So this is just one of the ex examples of work um, that uh, we've been trying to do every Friday. Uh, we shake ourselves out of our kind of idea of the end of the week and come together and try even now, while we all are respectively sitting in our different offices away from each other to kind of collectively study what otherwise goes under the name of big data. And that at times allows us to have like a, yet another perspective on, on an event like uh, Kristallnacht. And in this case, I think it just highlights now from the perspective of one particular town, Hamburg, that indeed this event coincides with an increase of suicides with large increases in terms of imprisonment, and therefore explains this very devastating experience. 
uh, while also at the same time, this additional database from Shanghai um, illustrates that at this point, German Jews, Austrian Jews, and other Jews are just trying to find some way out of either Germany or Austria, no matter where it is, and no matter how far it uh, is. And therefore, good many of them, almost 20,000, like I said, end up in Shanghai. I'm gonna stop now sharing my screen as well and come back again um, to our regular view so that I can see you all. And first of all, I wanna thank um, all of the wonderful presenters, of course, our um, immensely talented graduate students, our uh, faculty, Professor Patterson and Professor Valente, um, all of you for being here. And now I wanna just um, kind of try to answer one question, which I'm afraid is impossible to answer, but since Sally Belovsky asked that question, I will try my very best uh, nonetheless. And then that question is an interesting one because in lots of ways we've been tracking it in different ways. And I, you correct me, Sally, our um, long-term chairman of the advisory board, if I paraphrase this incorrectly, but Sally asked me in an email, what is different about remembering Kristana this year for many of the previous years? If I, Paraphrase your question correctly, you nod, okay? So I get this right, okay. I see big nodding. And I think part of what we've been trying to track thus far is simply that from the very first moment of Kristana, from the diaries that Sarah Valente introduced us to, all the way to the testimonies that Amel was presenting, that in lots of ways, what Kristana was or it became is something that constantly changed from this immediate kind of sense of danger that the pages of the diary were chronicling to this more distant perspective of what it ultimately may have become. And I think that's, you know, in lots of ways for us, I think also once again, um, I think what we have to remember, what, what for, stands out for me in lots of ways always is um, that and I tried to emphasize this in reference to um, Angie's presentation, that it happened in plain sight, that it happened in very, very plain sight in view of, of the world. That if, if up until 38, one could have said, well, maybe not everything that the Nazis ultimately were considering to do or not, um, that may, maybe some things happen on smaller regional levels and maybe some of it you know, only concerned certain aspects of the society. In 38, we're dealing with state-sponsored violence on a large scale, with large scale, silent, passive, and active participation of large parts of the German population. And I think, the, so this is, you know, the one thing that stands out to me, which makes, I think, unfortunately, the memory of Kristana today all the more relevant in my mind. The other thing that also stands out that I think at the beginning of November, 1938, nobody was contemplating that that was to come. That in lots of ways, the other thing that, that marks this, I think again, as a really alarming a memory for us is how quickly now is now not just the state, but the society as a whole could willingly actively partake in, in, in this large scale violence. And I think that if anything should, in my mind, you know, alert us to the fact that, you know, we don't always know exactly where today is gonna be tomorrow. In other words, where respectively our own well, time is they can't, moving. They can't trash Trump and, and, anyway. And I, thank you. And I think um, that's for me the alarming part that, a crime of that magnitude was able to happen without it, you know, right away resulting in dramatic measures on a larger scale from any of the surrounding countries. I mean, we know of, of, of course, of the kinder transport, but that was very limited, right? In lots of ways, what German Jews experience on a large scale after Kristallnacht is the inability to get anywhere because most countries are not willing any longer to take on large numbers of refugees. And I think if maybe Sally 10 years ago, uh, we would have remembered tonight on uh, the Kristallnacht, then it might have you know, appeared more as a part of a, of a horrible past far and distant away. 
Whereas, you know, I'm afraid for me, it looks a lot closer right now. And I think we can be less certain about our own future. But that's, I started out by saying that I'm going to give it a try because you, you asked that question and I will not like not try to um, engage your question, but I think it's for us to decide and for us to also to decide what that, how, where are we going to be in a year's time? And I think that's the real importance of these events that in lots of ways, they serve us also to orient ourselves in our own time, not just to remember, but serve us ours, for ourselves to think about respectively where we are and, uh, and uh, to become as we have been, I think, ever more engaged and ever more virulent, realizing that it's for us to decide where tomorrow will be. Thank you all for being here. Thank you again for applauding all participants. Um, I thought for tonight, I wanted to have rather this more collective effort than rather one uh, lecture. And I think um, hopefully you will agree that um, by the brilliance of the presenters and their intuition and um, kind of empathy with which they treated with the topic, you've seen far more than you would have otherwise. So thank you again, in particular for our graduate students, Philip, Angie, and Amel, but also obviously for Sarah Lente and David Patterson, and of course, Shafali, how could I have forgotten you, um, for really um, helping us to tackle this, you know, question sometimes in a very different way that without her skills, we wouldn't be even remotely be able to, to entertain. So thank you again all for being here and thank you for being good friends and of the Ackerman Center and continuously, um, you know, working with us to remember the past and to help the future a little bit along as much as we can. Yeah, Nils, I'd, yes. I'd, li I'd like to tell Sully what, what the Ackerman Center presentation meant to me this year, as opposed to all the past years. And I want to say that it became so intimate and personal and it was totally different than the abstract, it was always painful, but it was painful in the abstract until tonight. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. This, I think I would like to end on that note because I think we cannot do much better than uh, with that praise. So thank you again all for being here. And please Thanks. continue to follow our advertisement on Facebook and elsewhere and uh, we'll see each other soon again. Good evening, Laila Tov. Laila Tov, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good, Good night.